have kept my video off and I know a lot of people are waiting. So perhaps I can uh, begin by Shia. Uh, sorry, Shia, in case you haven't spoken yet, I couldn't hear that. But why don't you begin by telling us about, uh, you know, where do you see the whole issue of uncertainty, especially from the uh, prospect and the context of employers and employability? Okay, so good morning, uh, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, logging in from New York City. Um, I think it's, it's most recently the International Labour Organization has come out with some really, really difficult statistics, which I'd like to first share with you. More or less 94% of the world's population has been in some form of a lockdown. And 305 million full-time jobs have been lost. And 38% of the workforce, 1.25 billion, are really working in high-risk areas. So these statistics are the background for really not only a problem in India, but worldwide. But if we focus in on youth in particular, before the crisis, 178 million youth were unemployed. And in India, where you have your youth involved, you have a huge opportunity because you have so many young, youthful, uh, talented young people. However, given the crisis, everything has become even more dramatic. Now, a little bit about me and my background. Prior to the present job I have, I ran the Global Apprenticeship Network where I was really promoting the idea of employer-driven education. I still believe firmly in that, and even more during this crisis, that employers will play a very, very important role in this recovery. And now recently I've moved on to become the representative of the International Organization of Employers to the UN. And when I recently took on this job, we were looking at the SDGs, particularly SDG 4, education, aid, decent work, and for partnerships. And we were talking about, only in January, we were talking about how we're behind in the SDGs and that we really need this decade of action. But how would we know that today we would find ourselves really in this crisis where we have jobs that have been lost, particularly in high-risk areas of tourism, food, manufacturing, and the arts, but yet, there are opportunities. And we see that it becomes even more important in the area of health, the care economy, in utilities, in agriculture, and most importantly, and I'll allude to this later, is the whole area of education. I think there's an enormous opportunity for us once we get past this serious area of where we need to focus now on the health of all our people. Um, when we move on, the next stage is jobs, creation of more jobs, giving opportunities to young and older workers, but they will need skills. And there will need to be a reskilling and an investment in really trying to build a talent pool that, in the case of India, with your reverse migration, you have lost a lot of your skilled labor. How do you bring that back? How do you retrain people? And I think this is a huge opportunity where I think India could take a very important role. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Shia. I'll uh, request Mr. Singhania Harshi if you could come in here. Uh, you know, you are uh, an industry leader. Uh, you have a huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, presence in manufacturing sector. So uh, for manufacturing specifically, things have been pretty tough. What kind of uncertainties are you managing? And, you know, as, as a business leader, uh, not just for your group, but also in India, uh, how do you see India navigating out of this? Uh, good question, Pranjal. Uh, thank you, uh, friends. Delighted to be here uh, at, this, uh, at this event. And thank you for, for the opportunity. Uh, you know, manufacturing is one of those areas. And I, I like to pick up one issue from where she left. Uh, which was the whole issue of reverse migration that we've seen in India. Uh, we actually are now realizing the extent to which, I mean, it was known statistically, but feeling on the ground in terms of how much uh, informal uh, workers 
for contributing to the Indian economy. And what we are seeing in manufacturing uh, is that there has been this reverse migration where people who were working at factories, who were working at, uh, at different in different states have gone back to their home states. And this has left, um, has made challenges for work to happen because they were an important part of the, of the workforce. And particularly when we talk in terms of projects, uh, you know, infrastructure projects or new capital investment which the government wants, these people were very important constituents in that. So this is one challenge that manufacturing faces. But I want to come back to a bigger thing currently in India, which is it is relatively easier to scale up and build, I mean, to, to, to start up plants. But the biggest challenge we are seeing is on the demand front currently. I'm sure this is the case globally, but this is where we see challenges. So in our own group, for example, uh, once the lockdown ended, we were able to start up our factories and actually in some cases go up to almost 100%. But then we had to scale them back or even take smaller shuts uh, for temporary periods of time because demand was not, not coping up. So this is one issue. The other issue I'd like to quickly flag is we need to rethink perhaps the manufacturing paradigm and see to what extent this thing will force digital and technology use. So things like IoT, uh, greater use of analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, distributed working uh, in offices, greater decentralization, and frankly, I would like to change the lexicon from work from home uh, to work from anywhere. And really, we are looking at that kind of a situation. Uh, and it also requires a cultural change because all of us in our adult lives have, have mentally been prepared or prepared ourselves in a particular way. So this will make a big change. So let me, let me pause here at this point. That's a that's a good point. I think work from anywhere, but I would also perhaps add that it's not just work from anywhere, but work in any way possible. So, you know, my, my belief is that the concept of employment and job, which is really something like an 18th century concept of a nine to five uh, uh, project. Uh, I think that needs to be rethought as well, because if you can work from anywhere, then it also means that you don't have to get into that employment thing. You can you can work on specific areas of your skill and project and perhaps maximize your uh, productivity and your uh, work life balance. Rakesh, ji, you know, as as the leading uh, uh, telecoms and service provider in the country, you are, uh, I think, the foundation on which India is still running right now. Uh, so I think without that, uh, all the uh, uncertainty that we would have. Uh, we are facing, we couldn't have even managed what we are do, doing, the basics of what we have uh, without uh, a company like yours and services like yours. But what does all this mean for you uh, in terms of how did Airtel and Party Group, for example, manage this change? And as a, as a founder, you must have had to really inspire your team to be able to be positive and to look forward and, look and stay, stay positive. I, I think you're on mute, Rakesh. Yeah. Um, I was saying you, you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, I think the the, teleco the telcos, telecom companies really went out of their way in providing the much needed connectivity. In fact, uh, uh, during my lifetime, there have been many uh, natural calamities where uh, the, the, the telecom was uh, the backbone of connecting people with each other. But I think uh, this this pandemic, uh, which I have seen uh, uh, for the first time in during my life uh, lifetime, is 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 unprecedented. Uh, I mean, when we look at the large number uh, impacted globally over eight and a half million, high number of fatalities. What kept us going was the backbone of telecom networks, and I must compliment over twenty thousand of Airtel uh, uh, employees and our family members who were out on the streets on every day and making sure that the networks are up and about. And not only that, you'll be surprised that many a time when we get complaints of broadband not working, how uh, the teams have extended beyond and gone and helped those in distress at that point of time. Certainly, yes, we are seeing new ways of uh, working, new ways of uh, 
uh, work schedules. Uh, majority of my people tell me they have become more productive because they are now available more or less 18 hours a day uh, to to take uh, to take calls or or get on to uh, uh, virtual meetings. Uh, but but you must also realize that in India we also have a, a large set of population who live in two three bedrooms where they have their elderly parents, their kids, the entire family is at home. And uh, with the domestic uh, help not available because you are not allowing everyone into homes, there becomes a challenge. So for them, it was a struggle uh, to really get used to the new ways of uh, working. Uh, what I see going forward is uh, is going to be a mixed model, a uh, hybrid model, uh, where some of those would like to get back into the office at the earliest. Our offices have started, though at very um, less strength uh, because it's it's voluntary uh, until until the 30th June, and we'll take a review at that point of time. But I think uh, uh, clearly what I am seeing here is uh, the the large impact on the on the global economy is going to be shrinking by 5.2 percent. The the uh, global economy may lose uh, upwards of nine trillion dollars during this year. Uh, that's a huge huge uh, setback to the to the economy. But more importantly, what I'm also seeing is very high data consumption because you're sitting at home. So um, either you are into, onto virtual meetings, the families are on television, uh, education is happening online. So I, if I see all that perspective, there are uh, uh, streaks of positives. But overall, if I look at it, it's a, it's a huge negative. And I, I agree with uh, Hirsch. It is the consumption which has to move. And this is something which uh, we were grappling with in India. And uh, this has really taken us back. And my view is that this year, uh, until March 2021, is going to be extremely challenging. And uh, this will also reflect on uh, almost no further uh, uh, capital expenditure. Uh, and, and that itself will uh, you know, take, take a toll on a lot of the uh, uh, industry segments. Um, we have seen the, the, the uh, livelihoods being lost, how to really bring that back. And that is where I believe the governments and the industry have to partner together to come out of this trough and, and uh, start looking at economic growth six to nine months from now. Thank you. That's, I think, uh, excellent. I think the collaboration uh, need has never been higher. I think even at the best of times, we've been asking for government and industry to be working closely together for a common goal. But this, I think, is creating the trigger for, for uh, governments to realize what the importance of uh, private sector is and for even the private sector consumers. And I think every stakeholder now realizes what role each plays in, in managing this ecosystem. I'd like to bring on uh, uh, Priyanshi here, uh, who is a, a startup uh, entrepreneur. Uh, Priyanshi, your experience in, in uh, the shock that the system received, but you as a young startup, how did you manage it? And what are the lessons that you derived out of it? Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Branchal. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for giving this opportunity. So um, how we recovered and what we were do, uh, doing during this phase was, um, uh, so at the uh, last day of lockdown, we were almost 4x um, the transactions that we were doing on the regular days. And on the next day, uh, we were at ground level. It was almost uh, zero transactions. Um, it, I'm sure it happened to the um, other industries as well, which are in, uh, which comes in under the uh, travel sector. But uh, um, it was not about um, uh, like we die in a week or month. Uh, we were, we kept on thinking about what we need to do uh, in the three weeks of lockdown. So uh, we made sure uh, to um, be productive as possible and be innovative. Uh, that was that is actually the need of an hour. Uh, so um, like currently, companies are also getting very creative and focusing on what is needed right now. Like uh, a day outing is becoming really popular, and many of the uh, travel um, uh, like portals are promoting one day trips because people are sitting at their homes and they want to get out. Uh, Air Asia recently started door to door uh, delivery, and um, we started in the three weeks' time. In actually two weeks, we uh, 
launched two products, uh, which is point-to-point -point service and trainers. We were mostly uh, into airports, but uh, uh, that was actually need of an art because uh, uh, we needed to take the permission uh, um, to uh, run as an essential service um, for uh, uh, like for hospital uh, pickups and drops. Uh, for um, uh, say, uh, there's a pregnant lady who wanted to uh, travel to um, hospitals. So we started as a um, uh, essential service, point-to-point -point delivery, and rentals for the same purpose. So um, uh, experimentation is something which uh, everyone did at this moment of time. We also um, uh, did one more thing. We uh, tied up with one of the biggest grocery um, uh, delivery company in India. And um, uh, we, because we know we had the resources, so uh, we were thinking what all resources we can utilize. So we have the a set of fleets who uh, uh, comes up with a vehicle. So uh, they don't have to arrange the vehicles for delivery. And there is a chauffeur who know how to treat the customers. So we tried that as well. And uh, as soon as um, uh, the lockdown opened up and the airport uh, opened up, so again on the first day, it, it was like, um, uh, again, 4x the growth. And now it has become stable. And for our surprise, um, um, though we were selling um, like a lot more about like hygiene factors that we are uh, taking care of in the uh, cab and as per on the um, chauffeur perspective as well, but uh, um, to our surprise, people were not very uh, keen towards hygiene. They were uh, like very keen towards we should get the cab on time and it should be like 100% guaranteed that that's what we give in. So uh, that comes to our surprise. So currently what is happening is people are actually traveling need-based. They are not on their like usual role of traveling. So even though uh, like our customers traveling to some other cities, more likely will not return back uh, in three, four, or six months. So uh, first thing is like as, uh, the need of the hour is being created. That is the wise thing. And second is uh, saving the cost uh, so as to um, um, like increase the runway. And uh, uh, third is making life easy for the uh, employees working uh, in the company. Uh, are all the employees are are at their home working in their flexi timings. And uh, it turned out to be really productive. As I said, we launched two products in two weeks, like the uh, like uh, technology and everything uh, done right. So uh, that has turned out to be a good learning for us. Thanks. You know, we, we have about 10, 15 minutes left. But, uh, you know, I want to come to all of you for one simple question. Uh, and please speak from your experience. From this crisis and the uncertainty and the upheaval that we have gone through and perhaps we're still going to continue for a while. What is it that we must change in our behavior, business behavior, personal practice, consumer behavior, or even policies that will help us become more resilient and perhaps more uh, inclusive in our approach? So I'm going to begin with uh, you, Shia. Uh, and again, keeping in mind that connectivity could be uh, bad, I'm going to uh, you know, s request you in the order of Shia, uh, Harshji, Rakeshji, and then Priyanshi. Priyanshi. So uh, Shia, if you could start off first, please. Okay, so um, first of all, to build on what uh, my esteemed colleagues were talking about, I think the key thing when we look at the sustainable development goals, we said we were behind, but now there's an opportunity. I think we need to build back better. And when you were saying resilience, I think that's what really, really is key. We have to build back in a more inclusive way. And we have to start thinking about things like climate, where are the green jobs, we could be doing things better. Now there was a mention of hybrid, and I think again, this is for those people that had the luxury of working from home. This is a change model now. Most employers now, in Switzerland for instance, you are allowed to work from home one day a week. Now they're saying that most probably it's going to be three to two days a week. And I think that's really going to change the way we're thinking about work. Now, the other thing is during this period, I think it's key, while we really do have to worry about most importantly the health of people, I think education is also key. And I'd just like to go back on, there are a lot of myths about, um, you know, I'm online, e-learning, education. And if any of you have been at home, 
like myself, I've had the pleasure of taking care of my grandson. E-learning can be a real challenge for grandparents and parents. And I think there's some myths around the fact that the more hours they put in, the more they'll learn, which is totally false, based on OECD uh, statistics. The use of technology does not necessarily mean more learning. And also, the most important thing is for me is that we really have to start thinking about what we call blended learning. You have all these IT programs, you have all these e-learnings, and these are possibilities for people in the villages as well as those who are, who are um, in sort of what we might call white collar jobs. And the reason why I say that is we tend to think of that everyone is going to learn if they have a computer in front of them. You don't necessarily need a computer. UNESCO is saying all this e-learning can be going on by the radio, by mobile phones, by television. We just need to take advantage of some of this. I also saw that there's an SME in India where they found out during the lockdown, 40% of the graduates were taking online courses. So again, this culture change of really starting to trust a people, but also trusting employers. I think employers have a very crucial role to play. We always say that the private sector needs to be there. I think the government needs to trust the private sector and the government in the private sector needs to trust the government. And in that trust, I think the private sector really needs to be, they need to start thinking of them as not a donor, but rather as a partner. And I think we really, this is where innovation comes. This the private sector is known to taking on challenges and making them opportunities. So going back on, you know, where is the opportunity? I think it is key that we come together. If we're going to resolve some of these problems, there really has to be public-private partnership. This is not an India problem. This is a global problem. Multilateralism, coming together, helping one another. We're a global world. Large companies helping small companies. I think if we come together and we really make this a human crisis and taking this really from our point of view as human beings helping one another, I think we can get through this. And we will get through this. But we want to build a better world, particularly for our young people. That's a good point, Shia. And, you know, uh, Harjit, this is, this is important in terms of resilience again. What steps must Indian manufacturing sector take now to be able to manage uh, much better and to plan a sharper recovery? Because the lessons have to be applied. We cannot have a similar problem again. You're muted. Ashir. Apologies. Ashir, I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm okay now. Uh, sorry, I want to backtrack for a second that, uh, you know, we, we, um, what happened when everybody went into a, an unexpected lockdown, uh, beyond the first disbelief, when things started coming back in terms of, yes, life has to go on or business has to go on, people started uh, innovating. So we were doing things in business, uh, you know, whether you call them these, the virtual calls, the Zoom calls, etc. But at the end of the day, business was being transacted. In a way, if when things were normal, if you said, let's let's do these meetings in this manner, everybody would have said, oh, no, no, let's not do it that way. That's not efficient. But we have found ways to make them efficient, to make them timed, to keep, you know, keep at the point and so on and so forth. In fact, we are finding now that many meetings that used to wait uh, for people to literally assemble together physically need not wait now. And you just say that, okay, let's, let's get you know, empty slots of these three, four, five or seven people and we can get calls going virtually. So those are changes in business models, which I think will remain post lockdown. First of all, we must understand that this COVID and uh, the COVID is not going away. So it's not as if we've opened a lockdown and tomorrow we are all free of COVID. We will have to make permanent changes. So this social distancing business, which will impact, unfortunately, uh, you know, travel industry, tourism industry, uh, many of the service industries, 
and, and as, as Priyadarshini was saying, that uh, there will be changes in, in the way those industries will also operate. So innovation and change in business models. We are now reviewing to say, okay, if we can work like this uh, in a manner, uh, why? What parts of our business was were were there parts of our business that were really not contributing as much? Can we do away with them? So there are all these kinds of questions that are coming up. So change of business model. The second thing is, I think, however, we need to keep connected connectivity or connectedness uh, as as human beings. I think that is key. And frankly, I am not in manufacturing. We are not in that sense, an IT industry. I do not foresee a situation where we can work completely from home. It will have to be a hybrid model. I think people need to meet each other as well. And also, as Rakeshi was saying, and Shia was saying uh, earlier on, we need to look at the human aspect of physical space. Husband, wife, family, everybody being together all the time is simply not possible. Uh, and therefore, there has to be that feeling of of each person's own space. And, and therefore some of those things, but it will get more hybridized. Also engagement with, uh, with with employees. So for example, when the lockdown was there, one of the things that we did was we connected much more actively with our employees at different levels. We formed different groups of, uh, of, of people. We went down to, to our lower level employees, engaged with them much more business wise and to assure them about safety, to, to assure them that, look, there is somebody there. So this human connectedness is going to be equally important as we look at look at changing. So those are some of the things I think we need to look at uh, when we uh, chart out our way forward. I think that's uh, brilliant. While we need to be connected, uh, I think the humanity of it is, is absolutely critical. Uh, because while uh, work from anywhere is a possibility, perhaps in the services sector, uh, in manufacturing, obviously, it's not going to work. And, you know, even if you look at uh, sectors like logistics, where you do need people to be around. Uh, but I think it's going to be a combination. It's going to be a hybrid. Perhaps the configuration will change uh, from a pure on-premise kind of work to uh, a shift where you will have people working from anywhere, but somehow also connected. Uh, Rakeshi, how do you see uh, the business models changing, which, uh, uh, you know, was uh, uh, was uh, referred to earlier? Well, first of all, let me bring some positivity uh, here. Uh, you know, my view is uh, we will be returning to near normalcy very soon. And as soon as the medication is available, this will be one another flu in our lives, which will come and go. So, so it's not going to be all that bad. Uh, having said that, let me also say that uh, time has come when the private sector, the corporates need to preserve, consolidate and innovate. Uh, and that, uh, that's going to be the key, uh, you know, to, to moving forward. And on the government side, I think they really have to uh, extend beyond uh, public spending on infrastructure creating livelihoods and jobs. And I believe if I look at the India opportunity today, uh, we need long-term sustainable policies from the governments at the national level and at the state level, province level uh, as well, uh, to ensure that when, we, when the investors come and make investments, they don't see surprises, uh, you know, a couple of years later or when the government changes, we've seen some examples that has really uh, created some issue. Uh, but having said that, I, I see more and more uh, digitization, digital India, that is going to be uh, a, a push, use of uh, future technologies, uh, AI, IoT, machine learning, robotics. And this is where I also believe that uh, industry academia partnerships need to be strengthened uh, globally, but more importantly in India. The, today, the academic institutions are preparing our students for jobs and future. I think the time has come when we need to start preparing them for future of jobs. And this is where industry academia need to be very strongly linked to each other. I did talk of innovation. Let me give you a very uh, small example. We run these Satya Bharti schools, you are aware, in villages where 40,000 students get free education. And we are also partnered with 800 plus government schools, about 250,000 students. 
I was pleasantly surprised when my teams moved in in the first week of lockdown and started creating WhatsApp groups, delivering lectures to the to the uh, students at home. And mind you, this is villages I'm talking of, where technology is a, is a, is a big challenge, as a big issue. And not only that, the the teachers brought in the parents into the loop by ensuring that their student, uh, their their kids are studying at the time of you know when the lecture is being delivered. So this is this is something which has really you know taken online education to the next level. Uh, and and this these kind of innovations will will be required. One important point which I want to make here is I think the MSMEs need huge support. And this is where the governments must support liquidity, cash flows for the MSME sector and ensure uh, that they are also funded well on upgradation of technologies. I believe the manufacturing sector in India need to invest hugely in upgrading technology, upgrading, upgrading skill sets, and hence getting into uh, uh, improving productivity of their, of their workforce. I'll stop there. Thank you, Rakesh. I think the focus on uh, mid-level companies are uh, is absolutely bang on. We have to be able to support them, and I appreciate the positive uh, statement you made that you know uh, once we are over this, we'll be able to look back and and say that well, we got out of it, so we are probably uh, you know we can tackle anything. Priyanshi, uh, some uh, closing remarks from you. You know we have five minutes left. Uh, how do you see the startup startup ecosystem? Uh, you know, facing new crisis because typically startups, uh, you know, are flush with money. They have a lot of optimism, but sometimes they don't have the experience of having gone through economic cycles. And what we've seen in the last few months is is a very sharp economic cycle, which could possibly take years earlier, but now has has gone through in just a matter of weeks. Uh, do you think there will be a shake up, shake out, and perhaps a deeper sense of rooting to the ground amongst the startups? Uh, yeah. Um, so to begin with, uh, Kanjal, um, so the businesses like or the startups who are fundamentally and operationally strong will survive. Also in uh, the startup industry, as everyone says, it's uh, more about the founders, how they perceive things, uh, not about the uh, more about the idea or uh, the businesses. Uh, so, uh, like in this space uh, we, that we have seen or uh, will be uh, looking forward, uh, data will play a very important role as um, uh, like the post-COVID, uh, what will be the trends people uh, or the businesses will be collecting or should collect. And uh, based on that, uh, need to create new hypothesis or need to create new uh, action points for the same. And uh, secondly, I would like to emphasize again on uh, um, saving cost uh, as to increase the uh, running capital for a business. It is really important for uh, startups. And uh, there can be like many measures where uh, you can save the cost. Even um, uh, one of the like largest grocery delivery company, they have cut down their cost to uh, 50%, though they have uh, seen the increase of 60 to 70% in their sales. So why not? Um, so to begin with, to uh, start uh, saving the cost, we can take few more measures. For example, um, uh, like uh, cutting down on the infrastructure cost, or maybe uh, turning few uh, full-time employees to contract basis, or keeping a small, uh, strong team uh, members where you don't have to cut down the cost, but uh, like focusing on these people and uh, uh, until you achieve a certain number of uh, transactions or sales in your company. So these are the two things that I want to emphasize. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanshi. You know, I think what we can all uh, conclude on, and uh, I'll try to summarize, though it's difficult given the you know real uh, breadth and depth of uh, thoughts shared by all our speakers, is is that in a crisis we can become bitter or we can become better. And I think this is an occasion for all of us to become far, far better in a, at an individual level as well as at an institutional level. I think we have to focus on the humanity of the crisis, but we also have to ensure that our business models, our policy frameworks now are far more inclusive, deeply rooted in our own realities, and then perhaps build a new future out of this 
which will perhaps make sure that whenever we are hit by such problems again, we are in a far better position to manage it uh, and, and continue to grow out of it in the best way possible. To all of you who joined us, uh, thank you very much also for your patience uh, for the uh, connectivity issues. I think this patience and resilience is going to reflect in almost everything that we do. But once again, thank you for joining us and please stay on for the next session as it begins. And again, a big thanks to all our panelists and the speakers for uh, sharing their views and sharing their time. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Bye bye. Bye bye.